Hi everyone, welcome to the Book Lovers Festival. I am Zana Freylon and I'm here today to talk to you about writing for young people, about creative resilience both in writing for young people and creative resilience for uh, us as authors as well. Before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I am on and that probably most of you are on as well. Uh, we are on the unceded and stolen land of the Wurundjeri people and I would like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So uh, I am zooming in to you today from my studio space. Um, I thought I'd take the opportunity to show my studio to you because this is where I do all of my creative work and it plays a big role in uh, how I get my ideas in how I keep my ideas, um, in how I record things I want to talk about and in how um, how I plot as well and uh, as you can see I've got a whiteboard full of both sticky notes and scribbles and uh, over here is my favorite thing which is a wall that is made of corkboard so I can pin things uh, straight onto the wall um, I'm running out of wall space actually I'm seeing as I go along um, and it looks out on a beautiful garden which is always good for creating things is to have space where you feel um, at peace and at home um, so this this studio space for me is where I come to write creatively I never I never do any research up here um, I never answer emails up here this is my this is my safe creative writing zone uh, and it's only with the pandemic that I have moved up here to do things such as uh, workshops and classes as well. So uh, the first of these sort of mini workshops that I'm going to take you through today is all about ideas, um, where ideas come from, how you keep ideas, what you do with ideas. Um, I'm a big believer that ideas are, it is, this is going to sound weird, um, but ideas are almost like actual beings. So it's not just that you have an idea, it's that you have to lure ideas to you. And I'm certainly not the first person to, to, to think about ideas in this way. Um, Elizabeth Gilbert, author of Big Magic, she just, if you want to know more about ideas and how to lure them, you should, you should look up Elizabeth Gilbert. Um, but it's, it's the sensation that when you have an idea, you need to pay it proper respect and proper attention, otherwise it's, it's going to go away and, and find someone else. Um, and there are lots of ways of doing that, but uh, for me, what I always do, and which is really important and a very important part of my writing process, is uh, I keep a notebook. So um, keeping a notebook is not something which uh, all people who want to write have to do. It might not be something that you, that you feel um, works for you, but for me it is it is absolutely vital and essential that I keep a notebook. Um, it is where as soon as I get any idea, any kind of spark of an idea, I write it down in my notebook. And maybe I won't come back to it, maybe it'll just sit there and, and go away, um, but maybe it'll turn into something, and maybe it'll turn into something years and years and years down the track, um, which is what happens with, with quite a few of my books. They come from ideas that are in my notebooks from, you know, years ago. So uh, keeping a notebook is a, is a really big part of my writing process and it's not a neat process if by any means. Uh, I'll give you a show inside my notebook. Um, you can see that it's full of scribbles, it is full of drawings, it is full of um, these spirals which I'll talk to you about a bit later on. Um, it has writing going every different which way it has, a, here I've tried writing in my left hand because for some reason I thought that would that would give me an idea. It didn't, but it was, it was worth trying. Um, so keeping a notebook for me is how I keep, how I keep, I guess it's, it's like my, um, my creative go-to, I guess. Uh, and it's, it's so valuable. And if you don't have a notebook already, try it. Even if you don't think it'll work for you, try it. And it can be anything. It doesn't have to be a nice notebook. It can be, um, you know, A4 bits of paper stapled together, which I do do from time to time. Um, in fact, one of the things that I found was really stunting when I first started keeping a notebook was I bought this beautiful 
gorgeous book and then I felt like anything I wrote in it would destroy the notebook so I never end up writing anything in it so if you've got a beautiful notebook like that um, a really good tip is to draw a big cross across the front of the first page and then you've destroyed the notebook anyway and you may as well write your ideas no matter how messy and crazy they may seem down in that notebook um, so another thing to do or another thing that I like to do with my notebook is use it as a way of luring ideas to you of showing those ideas respect but also of capturing a part of your day in some in some small way so um, either at the end of the day or the beginning of the day thinking back on the day before it's a really great idea to just capture in a few words or pictures even if you like something of the day before and you might find I mean I've gone through times where I've done them all in haiku or um, in poetry or I just write them in prose or I write them as a story it really doesn't matter it's just about capturing a part of the day in words um, and what this does is it means you can go back not so much as a record of um, of your life I was never one for keeping a, a diary or a journal um, but it, it gives you small moments which you can use in your writing and one of the things that makes writing um, really strong and powerful is having uh, small bits of every day embedded throughout the writing it makes it feel more real um, to the reader and it makes it more believable as well uh, and the other thing with your notebook is uh, and this was a this was something I heard from Max Porter who is one of my favorite authors uh, and he said his notebook he doesn't have just for writing he'll write down shopping lists he'll write down to-do lists everything goes into that notebook and what that does is it creates a space where everything is jumbled together and so you might find that um, two items which wouldn't normally be seen of, as going together are suddenly shoved into each other and butt up against each other in an unusual way and that butting up of two sort of disparate ideas can spark whole fantastic stories and actually it's one of the things which um, when I'm writing I'm always looking for two strange ideas to butt up against each other and that's what sparks the story so when I was writing The Bone Sparrow the two disparate ideas were children growing up and then children being locked away for indefinite periods of time in detention centers you know they're, they're two things which don't go together um, or for my most recent book The Lost Soul Atlas it was about um, a child in the afterlife and then having an atlas to get him through the afterlife so these, these situations where there are two things coming together that you wouldn't normally think of, they're immediately interesting to us. Um, and they create really wonderful and wild um, environments to, to start a story. So um, I'm going to give you some uh, writing prompts for you to do. Um, it's really, really important, and I do this uh, in all the classes I teach, and I also do this for myself as well, is to remember that that little voice inside your head, that little critical voice which tells you that what you're doing is wrong, that um, no one's going to like it, that uh, whoever your child, partner, friend is going to read it and what are they going to think, that critical voice has to has to go away, it has to take a step outside, um, it, could, it can wait out there, it can go venture around the garden, do what it wants to do and it can come back after you've finish this piece of writing because it's it's really important when you write that especially the first draft that you are writing only for yourself because it means that then you get to put all the bits of yourself in there um, that are really that are really important and really meaningful um, into that piece of writing and it doesn't matter if it's crap it can be crap in fact it probably will be terrible and that's great and wonderful and you've got words down on the page and once there are words on the page you can do anything with them I find that if I'm trying to think of who I'm writing for, if I'm thinking of my audience too much, especially when I'm writing the first draft, that then my writing becomes shallow um, and I'm just writing a sort of an echo of everything which I think should be written rather than uh, writing what I feel I should be writing. Or, or I should, I, you know, I'm not writing the words which, which are meaningful to me. Um, and when writing for young people this is especially true because young people can pick someone who is false out of a crowd like that you know they they know when you are being honest with them and they um, 
they, they don't respect people who aren't honest with them. They very quickly discount them. So uh, when writing for young people, especially, you have to you have to find the courage within yourself to, to write what's true. Otherwise, it's not going to feel true on the page. Um, so having said that, having thrown the critical voice outside into the corner, wherever they want to go for a while, uh, if you get a um, pen or a paper or a computer, whatever is comfortable for you, and I'm going to give you a couple of prompts. So the first prompt is um, something, I mean, it's called, I think, rocket writing, it's called a number of things, but basically I will give you a minute to write th to this prompt. Um, I will tell you when to start and when to stop. And during that minute, it is really, really, really vitally important that you keep writing. If you cannot think of what to write, just write the same word over and over, or if you can't even think of a word, then draw those, just draw a spiral like I was drawing in my notebook there. Just keeping the pen moving is what will free your mind to write. So the first rocket writing prompt I'm going to give you is a list. And lists are great. Lists are one of the things I do all the time when I'm stuck with my writing is I write lists of different things. Um, so the first list I would like you to write is a list of body parts. It can be anything any body part you can think of and you've got one minute to write as many as you can on your marks get set go Okay, so now that you've written your list of body parts, um, I've got another list for you to write. And one of the reasons I like these uh, rocket writing activities and writing lists is because a list is something very simple. We don't have to spend a lot of time thinking about it. We just have to write down words and it frees our mind and takes us, um, kind of takes us out of our own headspace. Because one of the problems when we're trying to write and trying to think of what to write, it's, it's one, always very hard to begin. And two, it's always very hard to know exactly what tone we want to take, um, how we want it to look, what idea we have for it. And so sometimes when you write these very quick, very fast um, uh, exercises, it, it frees up something in your mind and allows you to, um, to find what it is that you're, that you're trying to say. And the other thing is, with the list, there's no pressure. You know, you can't, you can't get a list wrong. Um, and that, that's very important too. So... Are you ready for your second prompt, your second list? Again, this will be one minute of writing. And this uh, list is to be a list of things which can fit inside a backpack. Anything at all that can fit inside a backpack. Okay, on your marks, get set, go.
Okay, um, so they're your first two writing prompts and we'll come back to those in a minute. But um, one of the things that I do a lot as a, as a writer is um, exercises in imagining things and exercise in the imagination. And it's something which as kids we do all the time. You know, kids are very often involved in imaginative play and the older we get, the less we do it. And uh, for anyone in sort of creative industries, I think it's something which they um, connect back into. And so it's, if, if you are looking to write, exercising your imagination and finding different ways to exercise your imagination is, is really important, right? for me anyway. Um, and something that it does when you start to allow yourself to imagine and allow yourself to sort of have these free, free play, I guess, um, is that you begin to twist the way you see the world. So, um, for example, you know, it's, it's, again, if you look at the way kids talk about things and they might see, see trees and think they look like dragons or things like that, if you, if you begin to twist the way you see the world and start to imagine what could be, then it, it seems to be that um, this is a really good way of freeing up your mind and allowing, allowing your imagination to take over. And I know for myself when I do that, then ideas come to me far more quickly and far more easily. And they're far more interesting ideas than, than other ones I would have had if I was thinking about it analytically. So opening up your mind to possibility um, is, is uh, vital for me anyway. Um, so like I said before, one of the ways I get ideas for my books and, and how I think to write creatively is to take two disparate ideas and butt them up against each other. And so this uh, next exercise I'm going to leave you with, um, and this is the last exercise for this, this first workshop session, um, is to take two ideas and butt them up against each other. So what I want you to do is I want you to take your two lists that you made before in the rocket writing exercises, and I want you uh, to circle the fifth, could be any number, but we can go with five, the fifth body part on your first list. Just put a circle around it. And I want you to do the same with the object. Um, maybe you didn't get to five. If you didn't get to five, that's fine. Circle the last one on your list. But the fifth object that can fit inside a backpack. So you've got a body part and an object. And now your task is to do a piece of writing and give yourself a time limit, maybe 10 minutes. Um, and you need to write, my body part is like a object that could fit in your backpack. So it might be, um, my heart is like a laptop, or it might be, my spleen is like a sneaker. Whatever your, your body part and your object was, you need to use those two. And so that is the title for your piece, and your piece has to describe how your heart is like a laptop. Or your spleen is like a sneaker or whatever it is that you've come up with. All right, enjoy. See you next time. Hello, welcome back and welcome to the second session in the micro workshop uh, for the Book Lovers Festival. Um, if you've just joined me, I'm Zana Freylon and we are talking today about writing for young people. Um, I would of course, again, like to uh, respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land I am on, the land of the Wurundjeri people, and I uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So uh, I spoke in the first session briefly about my studio space and how it um, creates a space for me to be as creative as possible. And my walls are plastered with ideas, with cuttings from newspapers, with uh, photos of things I've seen. Um, street art is a really big uh, repository of ideas for me. I take photos of street art a lot um, and I have these stuck up on my walls all around me. Um, poems are also really good. Um, quotes, things people have said. These are all things which I don't necessarily know what I'm going to do with them. Um, but there's something about them that has, has sparked something in my brain that has made me notice them. And as soon as, as, soon as something like that happens, then uh, it's really important to take notice of it in some way, whether you uh, take a photo of it, whether you put it up on your wall, put it in your scrapbook, in a folder. 
um, these are all things which can sort of add to, to your nest of, of, of writing. Um, so I know that uh, I am incredibly lucky to have this space um, and this is this is quite a new space for me and I certainly didn't start off having a, a writing studio um, but I still always made myself a creative space so um, whether that space is on your bed at your kitchen table um, in a cupboard for a while I cleared out the bottom of the cupboard and that's where I would take my laptop to go and write um, it's very helpful for me to have the, the one space for writing that I only only use for writing or, or at least that when I sit down with my writing that is the space that I, I know um, I'm entering into to be creative and it's very helpful it's um it almost switches something in your brain and you know I've, I've heard people say this for people who are studying for exams as well that if you're studying for an exam study in the same situation where you um, the same kind of experience where you'll be uh, having the exam so don't listen to music you know, use a pen and paper that kind of thing because the repetition of it in your brain um, it just it just bypasses the the whole warming up period it gets you ready ready to go um, so finding your place to work is really important um, and it's a way of of also respecting your work and respecting your writing as well um, so I encourage you to do that and one of the things uh, when when writing and when getting into the headspace of, of characters um, and stories is um, to figure out a way of keying in to, to that character whoever that character might be and when we're writing for young people we're really lucky because we were all young so it's just a matter of, um, of I guess uh, finding finding a way into those memories um, and using them because we have you know our brains are so full of, of all these memories they're these vast repositories of things which we can't you know consciously remember and take hold of them all but they're all in there so I'm sure all of you have had that experience of walking along and suddenly a smell will trigger a memory or um, a certain a certain scene you know like the way light bounces off water or it might be the smallest thing and suddenly for a moment you are back in time um, remembering this memory and the wonderful things about memories is it's it's almost like time doesn't exist when you're remembering it's like time is completely collapsed so if we can find a way of um, triggering those memories or of um, mining them uh, then we've got this wonderful wealth that we can use when we're writing for young people so one thing that I did um, and I do a lot when uh, especially at the beginning when I'm starting a new story and I'm trying to get my sense of what the place will be like and who the characters are I try to go back to places that remind me of when I was the age of my characters um, I grew up in America for a while so obviously I can't go back to the exact same place where where I was growing up but I can go to places that remind me of it so uh, there was I remember a park where I used to live um, and there was a fence you could climb that was you know you weren't meant to climb the fence and over that fence was a rainwater drain and a big tunnel and people would go in there and I was always too scared to go too far in there but uh, when I was writing um, my book The Ones That Disappeared which is set inside the rainwater network of drains I went back and I found a tunnel that was really like very quite similar to the one uh, which I used to go to as a kid and it brought back so many memories I mean the smell of the the dust and the water and the graffiti and the darkness and the way that when you're in the tunnel and then you look back it's so bright outside that you can't you're sort of blinded for a moment all those things were things which I wouldn't have thought of if I was just writing it on my own but when I remembered it all came flooding back um, so using your own experience is a really good way of getting into the headspace of a character and um, I don't believe for a second that you have to have experienced everything your character experiences and you know when I'm writing most of it is imagination um, you can use other things like uh, um, the internet is wonderful movies documentaries books by other authors all these things are wonderful things to use um, to help trigger those ideas anyway here we go we're gonna we're gonna mine our memories for a moment so the first uh, rocket writing prompt which I would like you to do right now is to take a bit of paper and trace your hand on the paper I don't know 
if this has been a long time coming for you guys to have done this or if you've um, perhaps done this with young children quite recently but even I found even the act of tracing my hand took me back to being quite a young child because it's, it's not a activity which we tend to do a lot in our adult lives um, so I want you to trace your hand and do that now while I'm babbling on to you so that it doesn't eat into your one minute of rocket writing time and then uh, when I say go I want you to write within the lines of your um, traced hand I want you to write the earliest memories you've got it doesn't matter if they aren't the earliest memories but go as far back as you possibly can and just start writing as quickly as you can as many memories as you can see if you can fill up your whole palm if you think of more and it goes outside the boundaries let it spill out over the page um, and don't question the memories don't wonder if they're actually real memories or just things you've been told whatever they are as they come to you accept them and write them down okay on your marks get set go Welcome back. Um, so something which I often get uh, adult writers to do and also uh, when I'm working with teenagers as well, it's a, it's a fantastic activity and it's one which I got from my dear friend Penny Russen, um, is to go and build a cubby. I don't know when the last time you built a cubby was, but the act of building a cu cubby is, it's quite transformative and it's for something so simple it, it gives an incredible amount back um, so I, so if you are watching this real time you might want to stop and do it or otherwise you know do this at a later point but build a cubby take time on it make it the best cubby you can and then when you've built the cubby go and sit in the cubby and just be remember what it's like to look out from the cubby um, take notice of, of the way the world changes when you're inside the cubby it's it's amazing it's you might think it won't do anything but I guarantee it will it will be worth your time and of course that was where my phone died but we are back now it is all part of the isolation video experience that we've come to love um, uh, so for this next exercise if you are inside your cubby that is even better if not if you are wherever you are in your creative space that's great um, this exercise uh, that I'm gonna leave you to do uh, which is a longer exercise and it's it's an exercise on um, mining for memories it's an exercise about remembering when you were young um, about thinking especially about how resilient kids are naturally so I know that uh, I'm asked a lot about how uh, how it is that I write such resilient young characters and my answer is that I'm just writing young characters and that kids are innately resilient because they have to be so uh, kids don't have much voice in this world of ours and um, you know if they if something is wrong if they have an issue they have to deal with it they have to put one foot in front of the other time after time day after day um, and they do so so incredibly well and there is such courage that kids have that they don't even realize they have a lot of the time so um, thinking about that as well when you're going through trying to remember <laughs> there it is again hang on um, trying to remember exactly what it's like to um, to be a kid about about the day-to-day -day struggles and also the day-to-day -day wonders you know there's things that you find just incredibly 
awesome in the true in the true meaning of the world that that grasp your attention and don't let go um, and when we remember we don't remember in order we remember in fragments and we remember um, sort of in a series of connections and uh, links that, and there are patterns in the way we remember as well it's sort of like that free association idea so embrace that in this piece of writing really embrace those fragments really embrace um, the idea of connections and links and repeated patterns as well um, so this piece that I'm going to leave you to do is called you are here and I want you to start by just uh, very quickly and briefly describing where you are at the moment um, your place as you are right now and then I want you to continue on and write maybe a page maybe two pages do as you know as much or little as you like but of memory fragments um, use use second person when you're doing this exercise so you know you could say you are here and then you might say um, the next fragment might be you are 29 you are standing on the street corner whatever um, and take let the memories take you where they want to take you go with them don't question them just just write them down in fragments make sure each fragment when it starts has some indication of time so either you know you are this this old or or um the actual date uh you know you are you are um under a tree 1989 something like that um but perhaps, perhaps start each fragment with the words you are and continue on from there. Um, and then when you've done that, do the exercise again and this time do it from the point of view of your character. And when you do it from the point of view of your character, try and use at least three of your own fragments and your own memories in that piece of writing and, and just see where it takes you. See um, if, it, if it helps bring the character to life a bit. Um, all right, that is where I will leave you. Enjoy, and hopefully I'll see you in the next session. Bye. Hi everyone and welcome to the third in the uh, mini workshop sessions for the Book Lovers Festival. I'm Zana Freylon and before we begin I would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land uh, I am on, the land of the Wurundjeri people, and I pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. It's wonderful to have you here um, virtually, remotely, wherever we are. Uh, around the country, around the world perhaps, probably not, um, but it's great that we can still do this um, despite the year that, that never was. So um, this third workshop I'm going to be doing with you today is going to be all about writing uh, character and we're, we're sort of, I'm looking at um, writing for young adults here but it can really be applied to writing any characters in anything you're working on. So writing good characters means getting inside the heads of your character and getting inside um, the thoughts, getting inside the feelings, really embodying that character in some way. Uh, and it's, it's a bit like having an imaginary friend. This is something you can learn to do and it takes practice, but the more you do it, uh, the better you get at it and the more, the more easily you can bring characters to life. Um, but you have to let yourself. It's, it's really a sort of a, um, a test of how, how far you will let yourself imagine. So um, I know that when I'm writing my books, one of the first things I do is when I start to imagine a character, I take that character with me wherever I go. I'll be down the street, I'll be in a supermarket, I'll be dropping my kids at school. And whenever I can, I try to think of what that character would be feeling in that situation. I talk to them, they sit in the seat in the car next to me, um, we have conversations. It's I was one of those kids who always wanted an imaginary friend and, and never had one. Um, so I have learnt to make them up myself. And a made up imaginary friend is is 
every bit as good as a real imaginary friend. So this is something I really encourage you to do is take your character with you, see them sitting you know, at the end of the table when you're having dinner, see them um, perched on top of the fridge when you're cooking, see them um, riding on the back of the dog when you're down at the park, whatever it is, imagine your character and, and just let yourself go with it. Um, and it's, it's just one of my favorite parts of writing is that, that play that we get to have as, as authors, where we get to really embrace um, imaginary play. And it's, it's, you know, it's what kids love to do. And it's, it's something which is so much fun and it's very freeing. And it really opens up your mind to seeing things in the world that you might not otherwise have noticed. Um, and the other thing is that you don't have to know your character to start writing. Um, when I first started out writing, I would spend a really long time at the beginning of a project not being able to write because I didn't know what my character was like and I didn't know what they would do. And that's fine. And sometimes that takes a long time to come. But it comes a lot faster if you can write yourself into the story or uh, write the character into the story as you go along. So um, you may not use anything you start writing at the beginning. The character may turn out to be completely different to the character you start writing. But you'll find out as you go along. Um, so don't let not knowing your character stop you from starting, I guess is, is, is what I'm really saying. Um, sometimes it helps to find an image that you um, resonate that resonates with you uh, and this can be a sketch, a drawing, a photo. A really good tool is to go through um, those websites they have I think it's one called This Person Does Not Exist and it has photos of, of people that don't exist but they look incredibly realistic um, and that's a good place to look for characters as well. I find them in um, magazines, online, National Geographic takes beautiful photos of, of people. I found quite a few characters in, in their magazines as well. Um, and if you if you can draw, sketch them out. I can't draw so I don't do that but um, you know if anything you can do that will let you get inside your character and let them reveal themselves to you is a really good thing to do. Um, another exercise which I've come across recently, it's a Linda Barry exercise, and she says to draw, she's talking about self-portrait but you could do it for a character as well, is to draw the character or yourself using both hands simultaneously. And what this does is it reveals something about the character, it brings them more to life. So this is um, one that I did, I don't know if you can see that clearly, um, but that is a drawing which is much, much more alive than anything I could have hoped to draw if I had been trying really hard to, to draw this perfect character. Um, and it told me stuff about the character which I hadn't thought of either. Um, so that's a really good exercise as well if you're trying to get inside the headspace for characters to, to draw the character with both hands. Um, I, I think there's something about it that makes it more unpredictable and that's what we love as, as creators is when we're surprised by characters and surprised by storylines and this happens to me all the time it's the, the greatest feeling in the world where you're writing and suddenly the, the the story changes and goes off in a direction you hadn't planned the character does something you hadn't thought they would do and suddenly you know the whole world opens up and it's it's very exciting um, okay so we are going to do a writing exercise now to, to get our minds loose get our hands ready. Um, this is a rocket writing exercise. I'll give you one minute and it's a list. Um, so just don't question the list, just don't question what comes into your mind, just write it down. But the key is with all of these exercises, the rocket writing exercises, keep writing. Do not stop writing to think. It's really, really important. If you can't think of something, just write a single word down over and over and over again. Keeping your pen moving um, is what's really important here. So I want you to write a list of questions that you would like to know the answer to. And these can be anything. They might be deeply personal questions. They might be uh, philosophical questions. They might be everyday questions. They might be what will I cook for dinner? You know, whatever it is, write down as many questions as you can. And I will give you a minute to do it and I will tell you when to stop. And your time starts.
Okay, and that is one minute. Welcome back. So what we are going to do now is we are going to create a character toolbox. And I'm going to give you about six minutes of writing time to do this. And what I want you to do is I want you to write um, a few lines, maybe a paragraph, for each character in your character toolbox. The first character I want you to focus on, I want you to um, write about a character from a fairy tale or a folk story that you know really well. So your favorite fairy tale or folk story. Um, take, the, take a character from that and write everything you know about this character. Um, they might be details about what they look like, how they act, the kind of personality they are. Write down as many as you can and don't, don't think too hard about it. Just, just write them down as they come to you. And then once you've done that for your fairy tale character, I want you to do that for as many people as you know. So as you can in the time limit, obviously. So um, when you're doing it, note the association between the people. Don't don't um, question them. Just just write them down. It doesn't matter if they end up all being people from your school or in your family or your workplace. That's all fine. But get as many details down about each one of those people you know as possible. Um, and the small individual traits, the specifics of it, is what really brings writing um, to life and makes it believable. It's an old journalistic trick, which is that um, when you start to use details and facts, you make things more believable. So if you talk about um, there being elephants flying in the sky, nobody believes you. But if you talk about there being 74 grey elephants flying in the sky, it suddenly makes it far more believable. Um, and this is something which I learned from uh, reading Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and he talks about this in interviews that he's done. He's sort of the master of magical realism. Um, and he says, in journalism, just one fact that is false prejudices the entire work. In contrast, in fiction, one single fact that is true gives legitimacy to the entire work. That's the only difference, and it lies in the commitment of the writer. A novelist can do anything he wants so long as he makes people believe in it. So um, that's what I want you to do. I want you to now, I'll give you six minutes, write down as about as many characters as you possibly can and think of the specifics. And they might be something really small, like, you know, has a green button on his jacket. That's fantastic. That's great. Write it down and uh, we'll come back to it in six minutes. Go.
Okay, so now we have this fantastic toolbox of, uh, of characters, of traits, of personality traits. And um, when I leave you, the first thing I want you to do is to, um, to play God and to circle the traits from your list, from your toolbox that a character of yours might have. So they might be, you might take something from the character from the fairy tale, you might take something from a character of someone you know very intimately, very well. Circle the different attributes um, that you find that appeal to you and bring them together to create a whole new character. You might want to write down this whole new character, the attributes of the character, or you might just want to um, circle them and, and have that in your head and that might be enough. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll tell you what to do with that in a minute, but that's the, that's the, going to be the first thing you do when I, when I say goodbye and, and leave you for this session is to create that character. Um, and then, then what I want you to do is something which I've discovered only quite recently and it's something I absolutely love. So there's a column which you might have seen before, I've only just discovered it, called Ask Baba Yaga. And you can look it up, it's on Instagram, it's, um, it started I think in a magazine, but it's a woman who has um, imagined herself as Baba Yaga, the, the wonderful Russian witch, um, and she has set up an advice column. And her advice is fantastic, it's, it so embodies this character of Baba Yaga that it's really wonderful. Um, I'll read you one now, but I, I encourage you to go have a look at it because what's wonderful about it is that uh, the language is very unique. So there's a lot of punctuation just everywhere, sort of tumbling on top of each other um, and misspellings that really bring it to life. Um, so I'll read that to you now. So the question is, Dear Baba Yaga, how can I forgive my narcissistic mother? And Baba Yaga says, Your mother wore a sickly hat full of black ink in its cloth. All her life the hat's ink linked down into her skin and brain. There is no telling what the world will make. It issues forth and forth. Many wear poisoned hats and dwell in poisoned bodies. These beings are not yours to forgive. They are and were. Everyone always is moving. And that's the advice. And it's become this um, very uh, popular advice column that people are writing into with, with real problems. Um, and Baba Yaga keeps, keeps replying. Um, and there's actually a book called Ask Baba Yaga, which is wonderful too. So uh, that's what I want you to do, is after you have played God and created this character out of all the attributes from your character toolbox, I want you to take one of the questions um, that you wrote down the first rocket writing exercise, one of the questions from your list, and I want you to ask this character that question and then reply from the point of view of your character. Think how they would respond, think how they would, uh, the language they would use, how they would spell things. Um, would they use words? Would they use pictures? One exercise that I did for myself quite recently was I was uh, writing a piece from the point of view of a gargoyle and halfway through writing this piece I decided that gargoyles have no reason to speak English and so I went back and I changed every single word so there is no word in this entire piece that is actually in English but you can still make out what's happening and you can make it out by the sounds of the words by um, how close they are to English words and by sort of the movement of them as well and it's a really I mean you know this this piece is never going to get published anywhere it's nothing um, that anyone will probably end up reading but it was a really interesting exercise to do and it really got me inside this character's headspace. So I'm going to leave you now to write your advice column. You might want to answer more than one question, um, one of those questions you had from your list and really embody that character. Think about, um, you know, do they write with their left hand? Do they type on a typewriter? Do they write with their foot and a pen in their foot or do they type with their nose? I don't know. Um, have fun with it, really enjoy it, and you might surprise yourself by the advice that your character gives back to you. So um, I hope to see you at the next workshop session and have fun. Bye.
Hello and welcome to the Book Lovers Festival. I am Zana Freilon and uh, this is the final session in my series of mini workshops on writing for young people. Um, before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians of the land we are on. I am on the land of the Wurundjeri people and I pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So today what I'm talking to you about mostly is about respecting the imaginations of your readers. This is especially important when writing for young people. Um, I, I find that so many times people underestimate young people and how brilliant they are and how brilliant their minds work. Um, and when you're writing for young people, it's, it's really vitally important to remember just how capable they are. Um, and this isn't only true of writing for young people, it's, it's true of writing for anyone. Um, sometimes writing is far more powerful, I find, when um, people or readers are left to imagine things for themselves. So we overlay our own writing with so much experience and we need to allow space um, for the readers to do that as well. And by doing it, it makes the writing far more powerful. Um, I know, for example, that adults reading my books find them a very different reading experience to a young person reading my books. Um, and that's because they're overlaying their own knowledge of the world, they're overlaying their own experience, um, they're projecting their views and values onto these characters and reading into things in a different way to the way young people might. Um, and it just, it makes for a different reading experience. But um, when I'm writing, what I try to do is leave space in between the words and, and space in the silences um, so that that can happen so that I can uh, reach as wide an audience as possible with my writing and also so that I can make it relevant for um, readers at any age to come to and to come to on their own terms. And so for this first uh, rocket writing exercise, what I want you to do is to allow the imagination of the reader to add to the story and to, to see that good writing doesn't have to be full of descriptive words, that we can tell a lot in very few words. Um, so what I'm going to get you to do, you have one minute uh, and I want you to tell a love story in dialogue in that one minute. So no attributions, no actions, only dialogue uh, and see what you can come up with. Okay, are you ready? On your marks, get set. So now that you've all got your love stories in dialogue, um, I'm going to read you one of my favourite pieces, and I love using this in workshops. Um, it's a piece by J. Robert Lennon, uh, and it's from this book, Don't Forget to Write, uh, which is a fantastic book. Uh, it's by 826 National, and um, they do a lot of work with, with kids and young people, and their, their writing prompts and activities are really great. So uh, if you're ever stuck, I highly recommend that book. But um, okay, this is this is a book. Uh, sorry, this is a short story by J. Robert Lennon. Um, he was asked to write a story in twenty minutes, and this is what he came up with. He noticed. He stared. She noticed. She smiled. He approached. She rebuffed. He offered. She accepted. He said. She said. He said. She said. They drank. They said. They drank. He touched. She laughed. They danced. He pressed. She kissed. They left. They did. He left. 
she slept. He called, he called, he called. He begged, she refused. He called, he wrote, he visited. He called, 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 called. She reported, he arrived, shouted, vowed, departed. He plotted, he waited, he visited. She gasped, he demanded, she refused. He grabbed, she screamed, he slapped. She ran, locked, called, waited. He panicked, he fled, hid, failed. She accused, he denied. She described, he denied. She won, he lost. They aged, she wed, reproduced, parented, saddened, divorced. He bided, waited, hardened, fought, smoked, plotted, planned, escaped, vanished. They lived, she thrived, he faded, he wondered, she travelled, they encountered. He sat, she sat, they ignored, he noticed, she noticed, he gaped, she jumped, she warned, he assured, she reminded, he admitted, she threatened, he promised, she considered, she sat, she asked, he told, he asked, she told, he smoked, she smoked, he apologised, she cried, he explained, he begged, he pleaded, she considered, resolved, refused. He stood, he clenched, he perspired, he spat, she flinched, paled. He stopped, he slumped, he collapsed. She stood, she pitied, she left. They lived, they forgot, they died. So that is this story, um, one of my favourites, and J. Robert Lennon wrote it on March 28, 2002, between 9.05 and 9.25 a.m. So with that fresh in your minds, um, and you can see how, how clear the story was and how alive those characters were, even though you know, there, was, there was so little that was actually said. So um, what I would like you to do now, and I'm making it harder for you because I'm only going to give you 10 minutes instead of 20, uh, is to write a story like that and using only subjects and verbs. Okay, on your marks, get set, go.
great. Welcome back. Um, I've got one last exercise which I'm going to get you guys to do um, before I say goodbye for the for the Book Lovers Festival. And uh, this exercise really gets to the heart of why I write. So when I'm writing, uh, I am writing to understand more about something. And it might be I'm writing to understand more about uh, the way characters feel or about uh, something that's happening in our world. It might be writing to discover something about myself um, or other people, but it's always an act of exploration. And when I write, I'm writing um, sort of, uh, it's, it's almost like I'm not, I don't actually know what I'm writing about until I've written it. And it's about, for me, writing is a, about sitting on the cusp of understanding and embracing that unknowing. Um, and I think this can be true of reading as well. You know, as a kid growing up, there wasn't a lot of young adult fiction around. And so I was reading adult books when I was, you know, 12, 13, 14. And I knew that I wasn't understanding everything that was happening in those books. But that was okay because I was coming at it with my own set of knowledge and my own understandings. And I was, I was learning things which perhaps I wasn't understanding fully, but I was picking up small bits and pieces as I went along. And for me, this was really exciting. You know, I was learning about these worlds um, and these experiences, and it didn't matter that there were gaps in my knowledge. It didn't matter that I didn't understand, um, you know, the, the full situation. What I was gathering and what I was getting was enough. And so when I write, I do this as well. And certainly, um, you know, I, I'm leaving those spaces in the, in the page so that the readers can bring their own interpretations and understanding uh, to the stories. Um, and I think uh, sometimes it's very difficult to actually know what it is you are writing about. Um, so you might be writing from a place of curiosity or a place of exploration and not knowing what it is you're writing about. And it seems, um, it seems almost impossible to write when you don't know what it is you're writing about. But I often write my way into a story. Um, and sometimes you find out more about your characters and more about your story um, by saying what it's not rather than necessarily what it is. So I'm going to read another piece for you now. Um, this is an extract from a wonderful short story called Bullet in the Brain by Tobias Wolf. And this is just a part towards the end, it's a small part of the story. And this comes uh, just after the um, main character Anders was uh, shot during a, a bank robbery. It is worth noting what Anders did not remember, given what he did remember. He did not remember his first lover, Sherry, or what he had most madly loved about her before it came to irritate him, her unembarrassed carnality, and especially the cordial way she had with his unit, which she called Mr. Mole, as in, uh oh, looks like Mr. Mole wants to play, and let's hide Mr. Mole. Anders did not remember his wife, whom he had also loved before she exhausted him with her predictability, or his daughter, now a sullen professor of economics at Dartmouth. He did not remember standing just outside his daughter's door as she lectured her bear about his naughtiness and described the truly appalling punishments Paws would receive unless he changed his ways. He did not remember a single line of the hundreds of poems he had committed to memory in his youth so that he could give himself the shivers at will. Not silent upon a peak in Darien or my God, I heard this day or all my pretty ones. Did you say all? Oh, hell, kite, all? None of these did he remember, not one. Anders did not remember his dying mother saying of his father, I should have stabbed him in his sleep. He did not remember Professor Josephs telling his class our Athenian prisoners in Sicily had been released if they could recite Ezekielus, and then reciting Ezekielus himself right there in the Greek. Anders did not remember how his eyes had burned at those sounds. He did not remember the surprise of seeing a college classmate's name on the jacket of a novel not long after they graduated, or the respect he had felt after reading the book. He did not remember the pleasure of giving respect. Nor did Anders remember seeing a woman leap to her death from the building opposite his own just days after his daughter was born. He did not remember shouting, Lord have mercy! He did not remember deliberately crashing his father's car into a tree, of having his ribs kicked in by three policemen at an anti-war rally, or waking himself up with laughter. 
He did not remember when he began to regard the heap of books on his desk with boredom and dread, or when he grew angry at writers for writing them. He did not remember when everything began to remind him of something else. Um, it's a truly great story. I love it. So um, certainly go look that up if, if you want to find out what happened before and in fact what happens after. It's Bullet in the Brain by Tobias Wolf. Um, but I love that because it's a way of, of telling you so much by telling you what something isn't. So um, this is where I'm going to leave you with uh, the provocation to go and write a piece um, whatever sort of writing you want to do, poetry, story, whatever appeals, and write a piece that focuses on what something isn't. Um, you could begin each paragraph with, it is not, and see where it takes you. Um, and wherever you go with your writing, good luck, best of wishes, keep safe, keep exploring and keep being curious. Um, the world needs more writers, and the world certainly needs more people writing with respect for young people. Um, so I leave you. I hope you've had a wonderful Book Lovers Festival and if you have any questions you can go to my website um, zanafraylon.com. Uh, there's a contact page there. You can email me contact at zanafraylon.com and I'm more than happy to ask any questions you may have. I hope you've had a great festival. That's it from me. Bye. <laughs>